In the Chicago winter of 1942, John and Marion Gacy awaited the birth of their second child. The young couple already had a daughter, but John longed for a son to carry on the family name. On March 17th, he got his wish, when Marion gave birth to a boy. They named him John Wayne. The Gacy children grew up in this modest bungalow in a blue-collar neighborhood. Their father, the son of Polish immigrants and a World War I veteran, worked as a machinist building control panels for utility companies. Gacy Sr. was an uncompromising man who demanded obedience from his children, especially his only son. He expected Johnny to be like the other boys who played stickball, climbed trees, and fished. He pressured the boy to do well in school. Johnny disappointed his father even more when he fell behind in his studies because he was at home sick so often. Young Gacy was deeply confused about his sexuality, but there was no one to help him, so he buried his secret deep inside. I couldn't get along with my father. I mean, he was just overbearing. I was dumb and stupid, never would amount to anything, and so I just took off and said, to hell with it. In 1964, when John was 22, he accepted a job as a shoe salesman in Springfield, Illinois. The following year, his new wife became pregnant. John was thrilled with the prospect of becoming a father, but the yearnings he had repressed as a boy were forcing their way back to the surface. On February 24, 1966, while Marlin was in labor in the hospital, John was at a bar with a male co-worker. We went to his house and uh, instead of having coffee, we had a couple more drinks and I must have passed out. I woke up laying on his bed with no clothes on. Gacy had oral sex with the man and the next morning felt both exhilarated and ashamed. He pretended nothing had happened. He rushed to the hospital to see his wife and his newborn son, Michael. Gacy seemed to have everything he wanted, a family, a good job, and a new relationship with his father. But over the next two years, the real John Wayne Gacy would be revealed. But the ambitious family man was hiding a sexual compulsion that threatened to ruin him. An insatiable lust for teenage boys. One afternoon, while Marlin and the kids were away, John invited over 15-year-old Donald Voorhees, whose father was a J.C. and an Iowa state senator. Gacy asked the teenager if he had ever watched a stag film. When he said no, John set up the projector in his basement. He got Donald drunk to lower his inhibitions, then forced himself on the boy. In March 1968, the teenager finally broke down and revealed everything to his family. His parents pressed charges against Gacy, who was arrested and charged with sodomy. During the investigation, other teenage boys came forward with allegations of sexual abuse. Gacy pleaded guilty to the sodomy charge, but insisted that 15-year-old Voorhees willingly engaged in oral sex with him. This young individual made the charge at me. He claims that he was sexually abused by me. And in essence, he was blackmailing me for it. Now, what it boiled down to was oral copulation. And it was uh, consensual. The judge didn't see it that way and gave Gacy the maximum sentence, 10 years at the state penitentiary in Anamosa. He would never see his wife, Marlin, or his children again. There was someone who was struggling with an inner demon that did not have to do with hating homosexuals, but with being attracted to them. And John hated prison every day that he was there. After his father's death, a lot of hates, including that one, became much more powerful in his personality. On June 18, 1970, Prison officials released him on good behavior. He had served 16 months of his 10-year sentence. John returned to his hometown, Chicago, alone, and let his family there know that he was determined to start a new life. Gacy moved in with his recently widowed mother and got a job as a short-order cook. 
By June 1971, Gacy had saved enough money to start his own contracting company. He called it PDM for painting, decorating, and maintenance. The following year, John and his mother bought this ranch house in Norwood Park on the outskirts of Chicago. He could no longer control his hidden attraction to teenage boys. Something deep inside of him was about to snap. On January 2nd, 1972, Gacy picked up 16-year-old Tim McCoy at the Greyhound bus station. John offered to show the boy the sights, then lured him back to his house, where they engaged in sex. When they were done, Gacy grabbed a kitchen knife and plunged it into the teenager's chest. Then he buried the body in the crawl space under his house. The night of July 31st, 1975, Gacy had the house to himself and invited over one of his young employees. 16-year-old John Butkovich had worked for Gacy for nearly a year. First, on the pretext of doing a magic trick, he coaxed the boy into slipping on a pair of handcuffs. And he says, what's the trick to this? I can't get these things off. And at that time, Gacy went in his pocket and grabbed the key to the handcuffs and says, the trick is, you have to have the key. Then, with his victim gagged by his own underwear, the sexual torture began. Afterwards, Gacy looped a rope around the teenager's neck, then slid a stick between the knots. It's in the tourniquet, so it cut off the air. So if you're gonna kill somebody, you, you just put it on their neck and twist it three times or four times or whatever until the person stopped moving. He removed the handcuffs and disposed of the body. Now, Gacy had killed twice. His psychiatrists would come to believe that the motive could be traced to his abusive childhood. Gacy's double life had taken shape. Family, friends, and business associates had no idea who the real John Wayne Gacy was. Not only was he a prosperous entrepreneur by day, but even entertained children in hospitals. He would dress up as a clown he called Pogo. When I got into clown makeup, I regressed into childhood. It was fun being a clown because you could, you, you could be yourself or, or just let yourself go and act a fool. Gacy would abduct teenage boys, sometimes at gunpoint, and drive them back to his suburban house, where he would rape and kill them. But he was growing tired of digging holes in his crawl space. He... By the end of 1977, Gacy had killed 19 young men in his home, all the while carefully maintaining his double life. By December, Gacy was committing a murder every two or three weeks. He showed no signs of stopping, until an investigation into a missing youth would lead police to Gacy's front door. By 1978, 36-year-old John Wayne Gacy had sexually tortured and killed 32 young men. He abducted 15-year-old Rob Peast, who worked at the drugstore. Gacy had lured him into the car with the promise of a better paying job with his company. The teenager was never seen alive again. He became Gacy's 33rd victim. The next day, after witnesses at the pharmacy said Peast was last seen with Gacy, police questioned him about the boy's disappearance. This time, Gacy couldn't talk his way out of trouble. Police didn't buy his story and got a warrant to search his house. When one of the officers smelled a foul odor coming from the air vents, investigators were all but convinced that the crawl space below had become Gacy's makeshift burial ground. Gacy realized the truth about his serial killings would soon be exposed. Out of desperation, he met with his attorney for an all-night confession. He was gonna prove to me that he committed the murders, and I don't want any part of that. Amarati didn't need to see it, because within hours, investigators were on their way. On December 21st, 1978, John Wayne Gacy was arrested for murder. At the police station, Gacy seemed to take the news well and even joked with police while they were booking him. Gacy's home in suburban Chicago was besieged by a fleet of officers and evidence technicians. Captured on this rare police video, 
The excavation of the crawl space was carried out with the precision of an archaeological dig. Piece by piece, officers lifted the remains of Gacy's victims through the floorboards and carried them out the front door. It was then that John Wayne Gacy was introduced to the world as the worst serial killer in American history. In February 1980, 37-year-old John Wayne Gacy went on trial in Chicago for the murders of 33 young men and boys. His case attracted widespread attention as people struggled to understand how anyone could be responsible for so many appalling crimes. I don't think we ever know the person. I really don't. I don't think there's any way you can ever know what's going on through another person. And it's kind of scary to think that we don't know. I mean, we just really don't know. <laughs>